you were supposed to go on some, or not a listing, a showing or something. And I was like, oh shit, she hasn't responded in like two or three hours. I drove all the way over there. Why wouldn't I have responded? If I, I told you that I was. I there. It was I, right in Guilford. I would have told you if I was worried. I forget driver. the situation. Hmm. It was a sketchy situation. All right. This is Byron Lazine and Nicole White, and you are tuned in to episode 58 of The Real Word. Good thing you knew. Oh, I just asked two minutes ago. Word oh. is up, folks. Word up. Word. Word is up. Welcome back. Thank you. We missed a week because um, of you. I know. Actually, I want to apologize because the video that was on Instagram Live that we repurposed into an actual video episode, what was that mess? 56 maybe? 55? 50-something? 50 uh-huh. No, it wasn't 57. Maybe it was. Anyways, you were in Florida. that one that was, was two weeks ago. Kind of sketchy audio. Yeah, I missed last week. You're All of orange. this is one hundred percent my fault. All of it is one hundred percent my fault. Hmm. So one hundred percent back. We're here. Um, we it's are freezing here. cold though. Like I, if you had an injury right now, I could like I could cool it. I could do some things with yes. it. Yes. Well, it's like ice cubes in here. I pulled my hamstring, so maybe that'll. Oh, is that is that why you pulled, were stretching? Yeah, like I. You were like was putting your leg night, so on like my chair, and yeah, like you were no, doing all sorts wasn't of weird your chair, things. It was the community chair. Well, Anyways, whatever. Um, I'm back. We're Welcome full back. swing. Yeah. Like the real world is happening every single week. We're here. As always, we only really missed what two weeks in January. One week. One week. One. Yeah, it was one just week. one. It was just last week. Okay. You pulled through. We did it. Um. So we've got that. What else do we have happening before we get into our rackets? We've got, uh, well, I've got. I don't know. I feel like that's a trick question. I've got something, Uh-oh. maybe. What's, um, what do you, oh gosh. What, what, I don't know. What are we supposed to be, what are we like disclosing? We've got uh, the new studio coming. We're going to do a real word from there. So oh, we are? Yeah. Hmm. We're going to do a real, real word That'll there. Be fun. This Friday, you and I are going to do a podcast for the first time with three. Mm-hmm. Uh, people well, three people in the, in podcast. the podcast room. Yeah, because we've done room. we've done a threesome before. Well, we've done a uh, podcast we've done with a three three person <laughs> podcast in the past, <laughs> and I'm gonna get those uh, arms for this studio as well. Oh, see, I like yeah. mine. I know you like these, but we're gonna I go like with the mine. arms. I like like the arms better. If you haven't checked out, I'm gonna just give my own, my own little shout out. I guess so. The Byron Why Lazine not? Podcast. Why not? Go check that out. Why not? You know, can Why we not? link that up now? Why not? If you need to buy or sell a house, talk to Byron. No. If you are looking to invest, call Byron. No, no, no. The, the podcast. Um, if you want to read a great blog, you're going to be on Byron. the podcast. Right. You know? Yeah, I get it. A lot it. of good agents have, and I think that's interesting to people that are following this, really successful agents. What are they doing? How are they getting there? Mm-hmm. We've got Brian, who's a mortgage guy, super successful mortgage guy. Mm-hmm. Anybody you think that we should be talking to? I think it's know. all good stuff. Yeah. For 2019. All right, let's get into the rackets because somebody here. wants to hear about this stuff. No. So racket number one is technology is never the solution. Mm-hmm. This is an Inman article. We link up all the articles. We'll link this one up, especially if you're in the YouTube world, wherever you are. YouTube world, you'll definitely find it in the description. Uh, technology never the solution by uh, Inman on January 14th. Bernice. Bernice Ross. And here's a couple interesting stats. Let's, let's mm-hmm. start it off right here. Okay. 2018 NAR profile of home buyers and sellers. Uh, this is a report from them and their findings to the Harris Insight study. Mm-hmm. 63% of sellers and 53% of the buyers mm-hmm. found their agents mm-hmm. through a referral from a friend, neighbor, or relative, mm-hmm. uh, or used the agent they worked with before. Mm-hmm. So there's one, I guess, stat or mm-hmm. number that you could say okay well if they're referral based then technology's not they're not going through a click funnel mm-hmm. they're not seeing a video and signing up on a form it, it's a referral right furthermore 75 percent of sellers and 68 percent of buyers interviewed only one agent that they hired mm-hmm. so that kind of backs up the first set mm-hmm. got the referral, referral. interviewed right. the agent yep. liked them right felt good about my friend's referral and we right. signed the deal and we, yep. we moved forward mm-hmm. Technology may help an agent or company identify who is going to transact now or make it easier to convert a lead into a client. Nevertheless, it's the agent who gets that first face-to-face interview who normally gets the deal and obviously getting face-to-face first 
relationship helps. Right. So it's interesting. So this, I mean, this article obviously is more about getting business, getting a buyer, getting a seller, not necessarily technology as an agent. Well, meaning using technology to get business, yes. Right, because I mean, I feel like- You're talking about recruiting or systems? No, 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 systems, totally systems, because I mean, there's, you know, CRMs, I mean, gosh. Yeah, because you can get a referral from somebody, Mm -hmm. and that's a good point, actually. Technology is never a solution. Well, you can, or or Vanessa can give me a referral, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, my friend, she's moving from New York here to Connecticut, Mm -hmm. and you guys should talk to her. And if I don't have the proper- notifications to follow up with that referral right 100 percent. i agree yeah. with you so again we're really it sounds we're talking more about technology in terms of getting lead, leads lead, lead generation lead gen. yes yep. yes and i agree i mean i absolutely agree with this because even if you are getting leads are you um like are you actually then getting the lead really right i mean it's a, it's really about building the relationship establishing a relationship being good at like relationship building, knowing what questions to ask, getting them to trust you. Um, I know. Well, I know. Let's and let's break it down a little bit. If you're solution. if you're in the They're luxury if you're in the luxury market, for example, yeah. They're not going to only interview one person. I know this is the stats and this is the overall market. Well, but, but if you look at the numbers, I mean, you're talking about what fifty percent. It was it was it wasn't a large number of people no, that that weren't going to more than one. Look at it. No, seventy five percent of sellers only interviewed one. Seventy five percent. No, okay. three out of four. Yeah. Okay. In the luxury market, you'll find that they do interview two, three, four people more often than at lower price points. So you you've got to always take this as say, okay, what's my business like? What's mm-hmm. what does my town look like? What does my clientele look like? Mm-hmm. And and if you're in a very competitive marketplace, say in Southern California, right? They're interviewing a lot of people, and then also there's certainly going to be uh, a number of buy, uh, sellers that just know people in their neighborhood and, and that kind of thing. They're just going to give or them Or they're the just hiring the person that is perceived to be the best. I mean, yeah. we find that in our marketplace too. I mean, there's uh, people that so. are perceived to be the best. And What I'll say is technology, if you're in a situation where you're going up against other people, right. technology and being able to showcase your systems, how you're going to generate buyer leads through mm-hmm. technology – is go- could be a difference maker could be that separator right. that gets you the deal absolutely ultimately. and and if not on the first appointment certainly if that listing um was an expired listing or a fisbo um i mean 100 percent, i think that you could certainly show your value with the technology that you have if that first, especially if that first agent didn't have it. So it's an interesting and, topic there. And it's, her punchline is the companies that have made the client experience their prime focus are the ones that have gone the distance for decades, regardless of the technique changes or market shifts. And I just had a hmm. really prominent real estate coach share a stat with, with yeah. a small group of us recently that he's like, you know, I had a question from an agent that says, um, you know, Keller Williams is, you know, I'm trying to recruit Keller Williams agents, but they're like, we've just got the best tech. We've got the best tech. But KW, who quote unquote, you know, prides themselves in having the best tech, has less than 30% agent adoption of that technology. What I'm wondering though, is that the back end technology or That's, is that like the marketing technology? I think that was overall technology. I don't know. I don't know if right. it, which one it yeah. was. But but we know most brokerages are less than 20% adoption on their own CRMs. And I think right. CRMs is like less than 10 these numbers are very well, low. Well, I think CRMs in general are underutilized, whether your brokerage is offering them or not. So I would agree that this is not a racket, meaning technology is never the solution. But it, it's it's important to show exactly how it can help you get the job done because the seller or the buyer ultimately cares about that. Show me an example of how right. you're going to get this deal done, how right. you've done it in the past, and how you're going to do it on this one. And if technology can aid you in showing exactly how you're going to do it, being clear on what you're going to do to the client, then I think it, it makes a lot And of you sense. have to, though, too, because they're also on Facebook and wherever they may be, even just reading a, an article, and they're seeing other homes popping up on their screens while they're doing their online experience, and they're 100% going to want to know how they can get in front of those people, too. So I think it's super important, and they're, I think you have to, you have to at least sort of weave it into your discussion because – 
Because you're going to get asked the oh my question. God. Well, they want it. They want it. And if you're ignoring it and saying that you don't want to weave it in, it's really yeah. all over. So. All right. Racket number two, how to recruit top talent like the big dogs. And this is part one. This is part one. Uh, Bernice again. Mm -hmm. So look at you, Bernice. Yeah. Tearing it up. Boss. Yeah. Part one. So there's going to be a part two coming. So when we say like the big, big dogs, we're talking about producing agents in the market, right? People mm -hmm. that are putting up numbers. And uh, whether you're a small brokerage or an indie, there's no reason you can't compete with the leading national players, these big brands when it comes to getting top talent. If you're one of these smaller brokers or, mm -hmm. or indie shops, um, there's a, a bullet point list here in the article, which we're going to link up of what you will need. And I can run through them real quick. Should I run through them? I, yeah. I mean, I, there's some, I feel like there's some really, I feel like the entire read is really good. It talks it, about it lots is. of really great things. So yeah, we could read through them real quick. I mean, I, I think what's the most interesting there too, and we'll get to that obviously as we scroll down is um, people think that agents are leaving brokerages for one reason. And that's really not the main reason. Right. The mm -hmm. number one, yeah, that was interesting in this. Mm -hmm. The number one reason agents agents leave their current broker, and so everybody's guess is splits, right? Of course, I got a split, always I got about a the bonus, money. Well, people money. think it's always about the money, but it's never about the money. And the actual reason she says is my broker doesn't have enough time for me. Right. Right. So I would say that's a racket. That is a racket. In the, <laughs> <laughs> not a racket, ultimately. Um, when you go tried and true. And I think that's what she's talking about. Historically, right. that's the number one reason. If you look at- You're a talking about like a single agent, like bopping around, yeah. if, if relying look, on their manager? Well, it could be the manager, the mentor, the broker, the whoever. Right. Okay. If you look at a snapshot of just the last four years, right? This is 2019. If we go back to 2015-ish, then I would say the number one reason is not my manager or broker doesn't have enough time for me. It's the money because there's been so many offers flying around. Hmm. You've got companies like Compass just literally going into cities and just offering every top producer big money and they're switching over. And I, I you know, if you pulled all of those top agents that switched over from, who, you know, company X over to Compass, you know, I don't think too many of them be like, well, my manager didn't have a lot of time for me. No, I agree. I mean, obviously, as you as you continue to read down, that was one of, of many. I mean, they're talking about. Um, so they're talking about culture, they're talking about expertise, they're talking about systems in place, training. Um, and this is what you'll need, and going back to the bullet list here, this is what you'll need if you're gonna be able to pull one of these top producing right. agents over to your team yep. or your small brokerage. Yep. An understanding of what they really want from their broker. So do they want, is that individual, does that team want time, one-on-one -on -one time with the broker, the manager, whatever? Mm -hmm. Uh, to the profile of real estate sales success. So they want to know that this is a, a successful place. Mm -hmm. I can leverage that mm -hmm. success. Uh, three, a unique recruiting proposition, a URP that describes your brokerage strengths, culture, and the benefits that you will provide to the agent. Four, the right interview questions, right? That's super important. Mm -hmm. The interview process and, right. and making yep. sure uh, they're even a fit. And then five, the answer to how joining your firm will provide the solution for the challenges that they face, which is why that interview process is so important. What challenges do mm -hmm. you have right now mm -hmm. as a producing right. agent? Mm -hmm. And then here are the reasons why they actually um, will leave their current broker. Mm -hmm. And so it's a family business, the family atmosphere, culture, all those things come into play. What I believe is going to come into play even more over the next five years is what she's talking about here, which is broker doesn't have enough time for me. Mm -hmm. People are going to require over the next four, five, six years in this business, real estate agents, new agents, agents that are on the come up, you know, whatever. They're going to require more training. They're going to need more information. They're going to need to be with top, top salespeople in their marketplace that are bringing in leads in a down market even more so. So they're not gonna switch over four, the next four or five years over the splits like they have, in my opinion, over the last four or five years. Hmm. They're gonna go where the, where it's safe yeah. uh, and they're gonna go where their broker has their back and isn't blowing a bunch of smoke up their ass. Right. That's happening a lot. Oh, well, and to be honest though, I don't think much has really changed. I think that, um, I mean, we see it sort of in our, we see it every day here too. I mean, I think that a lot of people do still sort of, 
when you're a new agent, you join because of like the split, because you don't really know much else. I see a lot of new agents not even know why they're joining places. Well, they so don't that, even know. Right. So, and I guess, I guess maybe split isn't really the right answer because I feel like when you're a new agent, 99.9% .9 of the time you're getting what you're it's getting so no when, matter where you're going. What, but I, I think that people... How about when you get the agent that says, oh, I got an offer. You didn't get an offer, dude. You didn't get an <laughs> offer, Okay. <laughs> Every brokerage in town, you have a license. Every brokerage in town will let you have a seat. Well, they want you everybody. You get an offer. Right, everybody does want you. So, But I think I think that that's the most interesting thing is that I think that getting into the into the business, um, you get I, – I think that there's just so many, like, assumptions of the business and, and people get into the business assuming it's one way or thinking it's this way. or So when you're entering and then once you get into it, I think the people that are actually legitimately sort of moving for the reasons that are um, that are documented in this article are the ones that are actually really looking to build a business. Like they're not getting into it because, you know, their kids are off at school and they want to make some extra money or, oh, yeah. hey, I'm this great influencer and I could make a bunch of money because I know all these people. Like it's really this like the people that are moving for these reasons are moving because they want to build a business and they know that where they are is not supporting what they are doing because they realize now being in the business that they sort of hopped in not knowing exactly so I, I this I, article is geared towards top talent people absolutely. that put up numbers yeah I mean and that's so that's what is really important I feel like in my mind to look at that because I think if you're a new agent maybe you should really sort of see what it, people are moving for so that when you're getting into the game, you're not hung up on how much are you going to make or, you know, you can start looking at what are they going to be offering me? How are they going to be able to support me? Um, what kind of training that they have? Because a lot of places say that they have training and I, I feel like I made my decision mostly on training, but like I feel like it was like super lackluster, you know. Um, they told me I could train at home and as beautiful and great as that sounds like that's not practical. Like you can't just watch a video at home, you know. Right. So, but anyway, that's sort of my two cents. I, I think it's a great article. I think that there's tons, there was tons of there's information. There. And part two's coming, so. Yeah, I'm curious to see what they say next, but yeah. anyway. That's me. All right, racket number three. The most expensive home in America just sold. It was New York City, and it sold for $238 million. Is this a racket? Is that sales price a racket? <laughs> I think it's flipping awesome. I think the best part of the whole article is the gentleman has lots of money. He's actually bought another home, and I believe it was Chicago. Um, he's just He bought it just for when he comes to New York. Um, yeah, this is just for when I stop in New York. Just for a place for him to stay. I don't stay. think it's going to be his uh, permanent residence. I don't think that it is. But uh, the bravo. I mean, that's 24,000 square feet of penthouse living right across from Central Park. Yep, I'm built. not a city gal, so that doesn't impress me much. But um, I would definitely, not um, I would That's take, a I would, I would, I would take a visit. I got to see what what that money bought. Billionaire and hedge fund manager Ken Griffin just cemented the most expensive real estate purchase in the U.S. Two twenty Central Park South penthouse is now. Uh, the Ooh, most but you expensive could run into Sting. In you could run into history. Sting while you're in there, though. That's kind of cool. Dude's worth ten billion. Yeah, I mean. Just, just for his personal use when he's in New York. No big deal, guys. No big deal. This is hmm. 24,000 square feet, mm -hmm. uh, two floors. Mm -hmm. I think it was a combo of how many units did you? I, I, didn't see, I didn't see that in there, what the combo was. Earlier this year, he bought seven floors of a Chicago condo for 58 mil. mil. Yeah, that was actually, that's a better, I feel like that's about seven floors. I mean, here's something. do you have like staff? Like you must have staff on Here's something floor. that's interesting, right? This dude's a hedge fund manager and he's taking his cash and he's putting it into big luxury purchases of real estate. There's a lot of people that still believe luxury real estate in this country is completely underpriced. If you look at luxury prices in For like sure. London. Oh my gosh, yeah. So Well, even they were saying even Japan, like there's larger numbers happening in Japan at the end of the article and then there was another Yeah, huge numbers in different parts too. of the country. Hong Kong and France. Right. This still is still below listings in Hong Kong and France. New yeah. York is still mm -hmm. no even though it's so so expensive, it's still on a luxury level underpriced mm -hmm. in some people's minds. So right. maybe he's like just like dude this is a great buy where I think it's not going to work out so well for him in the short term. You're talking about 24,000 square feet that he is now customizing and customizing furniture for. Well, and so if he's got like some super specific taste, mm -hmm. 
that's where it gets a little dicey. Because 24,000 square feet is a lot of renovating when your taste sucks. Right. Well, you're assuming his taste sucks. But what's really interesting, and I don't mean, I don't even mean to like bring in another article because I'm not even gonna, but maybe we could talk about it next episode because there was an article actually, I think that it was in Inman or Realtor because I don't remember. They were talking about um, the actual, the the people that are making multiple moves in shorter periods of time are actually making more money than like long term. So it might be a little piggyback onto that one. Multiple moves in shorter periods, multiple buy and sell. Yeah. Like multiple, like you stay in house for two years instead of twenty. Those see people, on this one, on this deal here, you got to stay a little longer term. I well, think. that or maybe, maybe not, though, uh, that know. or like in all honesty, what what I'm thinking is you have you have multiple floors, multiple like sp- like just I you split those up like seven floors. You th- That's are all, Chicago. Like you, yeah, but like you are they seven floors currently, or he buy seven floors and he's putting them together? Because if they're seven he's got floors, an elevator. Well, He's no. not going from like. No, know. no, no. My point is though, is if he, if, if, if this the, isn't like his house in the Guilford Green. The one, <laughs> <laughs> my point is, if it's, if it's, if if he bought one unit at fifty-eight million and it includes already seven floors, just split it up. Now you have seven units because right. you have different. I mean, I don't think when you get to that point, I don't think you want a lot of people close, close to you there. So. Maybe not. So. Whatever. Congrats to uh, yeah. to Mr. Griffin. Certainly, if you've got an article you want us to address, drop it in the comments or any topic for that matter. Please post it in the comments. Uh, I did see, by the way, some thumbs down on the video where I called out. Give us some thumbs down. So thank you guys for oh, a few of those thumbs. That's nice. Yeah, they listened. Congratulations so. on that. We'll take some thumbs up Feels this good. time, actually. A couple shares wouldn't hurt. If you're enjoying this content, uh, certainly share it with a friend who's in the real estate game. Okay. All right. Yep. Keep it real, guys. We'll see you guys next time. Keep it real.